In the final module for Lecture 3, we'll consider shifting graphs, new functions from old functions, and inverse functions. There are four main operations that shift the graph of a function. First, we can add a constant to the function. Second, we can add a constant to the variable. Third, we can multiply the function by a constant. And fourth, we can multiply the variable by minus 1. These are the rules that tell us how the graph shifts when these operations are performed. Let's look at them in Excel. We can see how these shifts work most clearly if we have a simple function, such as a linear function. Here we have y equals ax plus b. We can vary the parameters there. And these are the operations. So if we perhaps add 5, shifts the graph up. We multiply the function by 5. It changes the slope as well as the intercept. If we add a constant to the value of the variable, so we add 5 to each x, we stretch the function vertically. If we multiply the value of the variable by minus 1, the function is reflected about the y-axis. There are various ways in which we can combine functions. For example, if we have two functions, f of x and g of x, we can add them together, subtract them, multiply them, form a ratio. We can also have functions of functions. Let's consider some common economic examples. We can start with a cost function, the relationship between a firm's level of output and its cost of production. A cubic function is very useful for modelling cost functions. As we'll see, if we have particular values for our coefficients, a, b, c and d, then a cubic cost function has some characteristics that capture aspects of the real world behaviour. I'm sure you'll learn a lot more about a firm's cost function in microeconomics. So from a total cost function, we can get an average cost function, so dividing through by q. It tells us the average cost of production as Q changes. Costs can be broken up into variable costs and fixed costs. Variable costs depend on Q. Fixed costs don't. Fixed costs occur in the short run and are costs like rent, insurance, etc. that have to be paid whether or not the firm is producing any output. So here we have variable costs depend on Q and D are the fixed costs. So we can have average variable costs and average fixed costs. We see that the average total costs is the sum of a quadratic function and a hyperbolic function. Let's consider a particular example of a cost function. In general, for a cost function, we'll have A is greater than zero, B negative, C greater than zero, and D greater than zero. But more precisely, what we usually have is the coefficient a is quite small, the coefficient b is negative, but not as small in absolute terms as a, and then c and d are relatively large. If we think about this function, we can see that when q is small, these two terms dominate. As q gets a little larger, the squared term becomes more important because it has a negative coefficient, the rate of increase in cost slows down. As q gets larger still, the cubic term dominates. Let's look at that in Excel. At the top we have our total cost curve. We can see when q is small, we've got a, a relatively steep increase in costs. The increase flattens out. This is where the, the squared term comes in, the negative squared term comes in. Then as Q gets larger, the cube term dominates, and so costs increase steeply. We can also plot the average cost curves. So we have average total costs made up of average fixed costs plus average variable costs. So our hyperbolic function plus our quadratic function. I've also put the marginal cost curve here, so that's the first derivative of our cost function. We'll look at derivatives in the next lecture.
you can vary the coefficients here and see how that changes the cost function. Another case of a new function from old is one of the most basic in economics, namely deriving a profit function. We start with a demand function, so price is a function of quantity. So the demand function shows the relationship between the quantity of a good and the price for the good. Here we have price as a function of quantity. As we'll see a little later, this is actually an inverse demand function. From the demand function, we can obtain a revenue function. Revenue is just price by quantity. So we'll have revenue there as a function of quantity. We've already looked at the cost function. So now we have revenue and costs. Of course, profit is simply revenue minus costs. And since both are functions of quantity, we have a function for profit in terms of quantity. Here's the same cost function. To keep the example simple, we have a fixed price. So we assume our firm as a price taker. The price is 750. In that case, we have a linear revenue function. We have the cost function that we had before. So subtracting the cost function from the linear revenue function gives us the profit function in blue. We can see when the quantity is small, below 100, profit is negative, it becomes positive, and finally again becomes negative. One of the things we'll be looking at in the next lecture is how a firm can maximise its profit function. And that's where derivatives come in. Our final topic for Lecture 3 is that of inverse functions. If a function is one-to-one, -one, that is, if it is strictly increasing or strictly decreasing over its domain, it has an inverse function. For example, x squared for x greater or equal to zero. The inverse of the function, then, would we could call it a g of x. will be x to the half. But we'd only have this inverse function for x greater than or equal to 0. That is where x squared is 1 to 1. Let's look at that. Here we see what's meant by 1 to 1. In figure 1, each value of x has only one value of y, and each value of y has only one corresponding value of x. That's not the case in figure 2. So f of x has an inverse function, but a g of x here doesn't have an inverse function. So we could say that to have an inverse function, a function must pass a horizontal line test as well as a vertical line test. In figure 2, g of x fails that horizontal line test. Some of you might be familiar with the concept of switching x and y for inverse functions. This occurs when we want to plot the reverse function on the same axis as the original function in these examples. So here we have f of x equals 4x minus 3. The inverse function there in terms of x is a quarter x plus 3 quarters. Similarly with figure 4. In these cases we see the symmetry about the y equals x line or the 45 degree line. That's 45 degrees. However, in economics we don't switch variables for inverse functions as we'll see. These other types of inverse functions we'll be focusing on and you can look at some examples here. The main reason that we are looking at inverse functions now is the way in which demand functions and supply functions are represented in economics. The simplest demand function shows quantity demanded as a function of price. And similarly with supply. So we're saying that price is the independent variable and quantity demanded depends on price. More complex demand functions might include prices for complements and or substitutes and perhaps income. So we might have, say for good one, it's a function of its own price, the price of complement, the price of a substitute and perhaps income. You might estimate these demand functions in econometrics.
similarly with supply functions. However, when we represent demand and supply functions in the standard diagrams, we use the convention established by Alfred Marshall more than 100 years ago. Here we have quantity on the horizontal axis. In other words, in these diagrams, quantity is the independent variable and price is the dependent variable. So what we have in our standard supply and demand diagrams are not actually demand and supply functions, but inverse demand and supply functions, where price is a function of quantity. It'll be useful to keep this distinction in mind as you continue to study economics. That completes Lecture 3.